good. Um, first, just uh, something we've seen before, but just in case other folks are not familiar with this, I'll show these two, which are quick cases. So here is a patient with obviously a LVAD, and you can see that he has a CRTD pacemaker device in. So we have pacemaker leads in the right atrial appendage, right ventricle, and a coronary vein. Of course, at this time he's intubated and there's a defibrillator device. But I'm showing this just to clarify the nature of this additional lead. So this is a subcutaneous left lower chest wall lead. Now, when these devices are put in, they want to be sure that if, if the device is also associated with a defibrillation coil, that is, it's defibrillator capable, that a defibrillation threshold is met in case the patient needs to be defibrillated. Now, I don't always know exactly how, but they might determine that at some point that the defibrillation threshold is not reached with just a single lead in the right ventricle and need to put in an additional electrode or lead in order to achieve a defibrillation threshold. And in this case, this subcutaneous lead was placed for that purpose. Now, I don't know why they put a subcutaneous lead in this patient, but by history, this lead was put in in order to achieve a defibrillation threshold. So that's what that one is. And then I'll show you another one. In which we have a very similar setup. Now there are some epicardial surface pacemaker electrodes, but they're not connected at the moment. But this person has two leads for that purpose. The one is a subcutaneous lead, and the other one is a lead in the coronary sinus. The other place that one may see that is in the azygous vein. And again, I don't know why they put them in these particular locations in a particular patient. I think usually because, the, like in this situation, they may be, or they might anticipate having to put in the coronary vein lead they might not choose this in the coronary sinus as the first place so that it doesn't interfere with the subsequent placement of a coronary vein lead, perhaps. But in this particular person, you can see the history there that they placed both a subcutaneous as well as an additional shocking lead in the coronary sinus in order to achieve a defibrillation threshold, as you can see here. So in case you come across those things, it's worth knowing about that. Howard, I'm seeing more subcutaneous leads also put in sort of in the left parasternal distribution. Are you, is anyone yes. else seeing that? When I see that, it's just a single mm -hmm. lead subcutaneous in the midline over the sternum. And I think that's a relatively new device, but I do see that occasionally. So it is a single defibrillator lead in the subcutaneous tissues of the chest wall. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, and that's exactly what I'm seeing is a single lead. Right. Yeah. So I suppose there are new indications for that, but I, I don't know what they might be or what they are. Yeah, I see okay. that maybe once or twice a year. Okay, let me show you. Is David on at the moment? Can can you tell? Uh, not yet. Okay, I've got a case that he would like, so I'm going to save that one. Okay, this is a patient with um, an interesting finding and a history. So here is the imaging finding, which is subtle. So I'll just mag it up. And this person has uh, the history you might get, could be dyspnea or something like that. And I can't remember exactly the context in which I saw that or I was prompted to see that. But the finding here is tracheal stenosis. So from here to there is tracheal narrowing, and it's you know, moderate at least, and then opens up again. 
So when we see tracheal narrowing for a short segment like that, one of the things we think of, particularly if there's a history of intubation and prolonged intubation is stenosis from that. And let me show you, and I'll give you some history in a moment just to confirm that, say on a coronal CT, that will give you a feel for that. You can see the extent of the stenosis and its location in the subglottic trachea near the thoracic inlet. So that's real. Now the history is kind of interesting here because at least by what I'll show you here, there's perhaps an additional reason why in this particular person, that person relatively young got the tracheal stenosis. So you can see things started off with a blistering process involving the mouth and the oropharynx. Um, they may seem to have made a clinical diagnosis of the Stevens-Johnson syndrome attributed to a drug perhaps. Flexible bronchoscopy saw sloughing and friable mucosa. And then as you can see, the stenosis was identified subsequently. So the patient was intubated for some time. I can't remember quite how long, but that together with this mucosal injury resulted in the stenosis. And here you can see the procedure that was done for that stenosis. So we have the stenosis and, and the dilatation procedure. So kind of interesting um, how the two probably both contributed to, to that, but certainly, you know, we see a lot of intubated patients, but we don't see stenosis that often. And this wasn't intubation for months. This was shorter than that, but I can't remember exactly how long. So tracheal stenosis, intubation, and then the pre-existent mucosal injury syndrome. This one is just really cute, so really fast. I think Jeff showed one of these before. And this is just the observation of a small item. And the question is, where is it? Is it real? On a chest radiograph? And the answer, yeah, it is actually something. And then if you go way up and look at it like that, it's in the midline. It's just beneath the skin surface. And I think Jeff showed one of these before, if I'm not mistaken, but that's a an adornment. So yep. I guess it's popular to have that because you can flip off the top of it and you can put new little guys on top so you can have a flower there one day and something else another day. But anyway, you can see the stud and the subcutaneous portion and then you can see how it's put in and so on. Very is, nice. is there a name for that? I forget. I think you showed one, Jeff. Yeah, some I, I, subdermal jewelry or something, but yeah. So just a cosmetic right. thing in the and, middle. And the technologists typically ask the patients to remove the jewelry, but of course they can't remove the post, but they can unscrew the uh, whatever is attached to it. So if you know what the base looks like, or show your tech, yeah. or if your techs understand, they can put a note in the in the um, yeah. study so that you know what that yeah. is. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Okay, let me stop there, Jeff, and then if um, David comes on, then I'll show the other case. That'll be interesting to, to him and everyone else. Okay. Um, who would like to go next? I see Peter and Seth. Yeah, yeah, this did look better. Thank you for doing uh, I can go if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me just confirm that we're good here. I think that was just so, um, couple things that I have not seen before. So uh, this is a very interesting case that one of my Great. Thanks so much. colleagues showed me the other day where yeah. it looks like there's a retrocardiac mass, kind of the serpentine uh, mass sitting back here in the retrocardiac. Unfortunately, we don't have a uh, lateral. Um, so here is his CT and um, I also have an angiogram, but unfortunately I'm not going to show it because uh, it has some identifiable information on it, but it kind of highlights what we see on the CT. So you see there is this large um, vessel coming off the aorta, kind of almost looks like a MAPCA, um, and it goes into the left lung and then pretty much 
immediately, although it does supply the left lower lobe and then drains into this very large left inferior pulmonary vein. So initially I thought it was gonna be a sequestration, but you can see that there's normal bronchial supply to this lung. Um, and you can also see how hyperemic or how enlarged engorged the vasculature is in the left lower lobe because it's being supplied by um, the systemic uh, supply. And so this is acting like a, basically a really bad left to left shunt. Um, and I can only imagine that probably at least 25% of his blood flow is probably going through uh, this vessel, maybe a little less, but and it's going just right back to the left atrium into the left ventricle. And you can see his left ventricle is a young guy. He's like 30. Um, and you can see his LV is, is quite dilated. So I had not heard of this entity, but after Googling it, and um, it is known, it's called, uh, I don't know if you can see this. It's called anomalous systemic arterial supply to the normal. It's basically to a normal lung. Um, the most commonly at the bases. Uh, and you can see this one here. Uh, looks pretty much identical. And um, it, yeah, so I had not heard of it and I don't know what they're gonna do with it. It should be taken out surgically, um, but we'll see if and where they do that. Have, have you guys seen that before? I think I've seen that once or twice, but the vessel never that big. Mm -hmm. I've seen yeah. a small vessel coming up from the abdomen to a lung, but not a large vessel like that. Yeah, same here. Like that. That is. You see, to a normal lung, yeah. Um, and it's the whole basal or segments are supplied by this thing. So that's that's interesting. That oh, and the other fact, and the other fact, thirty. Any is there any atherosclerotic disease in that? I'm just yeah. curious because you know, they often get advanced atherosclerosis. Uh, no, uh, of the the that vessel or just in general. Yeah, no, of that vessel, you know, like when we yeah. see mapkas and stuff too. I was yeah. Just curious. So what's interesting here is that if you look at his um, ventilation perfusion, and unfortunately it didn't completely download, um, he has, because remember how the perf uh, perfusion scan works, he has basically no perfusion to that left lower lobe, but he does. It's just by the systemic arterial supply, and this is by the, obviously, the pulmonary arterial supply that this is looking at. Um, and interestingly, he has reduced ventilation down there as well, which I'm guessing is in part maybe due to some form of hypoxic vasoconstriction, given the fact that a lot of it is just being shunted right back. Uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, anyways, I thought that was a pretty cool study. Uh, this is a case that was just shown to me of a young girl who came in. Um, and they consulted me and said, you know, she had a CT, did it come across? No, anyways, I'll just show the CT. So she came in and, you know, of course she's being treated for, uh, you know, presumptive diagnosis of COVID, which was ruled out. And then they thought, you know, some other form of pneumonia and had a whole differential. But if you look at this thing on the coronal view, um, you'll see a lot of upper lobe central lobular nodularity and um, and the lower lobe consolidation. And this is just from the other day. So this is from two days ago. And this is a patient who is a uh, habitual vapor. So here's probably a case of Evoli. They send her for bronch and they're gonna see what that shows. Um, here's another case that whoop, different patients, sorry, uh, just show the chest x-ray showing some lower lobe ground glass in a young patient. And this is from today. And you can see, so they brought me to this to me and I've taught my pulmonologists. So not really specific, kind of classic organizing pneumonia pattern, uh, subpleural sparing, but striking subpleural sparing. And then you can see the striking peribronchovascular sparing here in this case. And um, also said, I, I hate to get the same diagnosis twice, but because they were kind of laughing about it because they knew what I was gonna say. And I said, is this another patient who vapes? And sure enough, she vapes marijuana a lot, uh, got a new uh, substance, she started vaping and got sick uh, pretty soon afterwards. 
Uh, both these patients had fever, abdominal pain, a lot of chest symptoms, and uh, she has improved once she stopped vaping and they gave her her, uh, they didn't even have to give her steroids, she just stopped vaping. She's an inpatient now. Uh, but this was first detected on uh, abdomen pelvis CT where it was, it, it was misread, but I understand why. It was just read as a pneumonia. Um, and it was worse when she came in, but I think you can also appreciate that oh, kind yeah. of peribronchovascular yeah, sparing. Look at this right here, know. how striking that is. So two cases of vaping in the last two yeah, days. Exactly. Um, I thought that was uh, uh, pretty good. Um, that being said, so, Seth, I think some of this may be due to the dropping COVID cases and stuff starting to open up. People are going out and hanging out with people and getting maybe I don't, I don't yeah or, or I'm always wondering about regional differences and you know supply chains and because both these patients have been vaping THC derivatives. She this one one of them just started recently because her parents, she was upset because her parents took away her. Uh, her um, pipe that she used to smoke the the flower. So she she got upset and went to the vape shop and bought some or got some. I don't know where she got it from. Some mm -hmm. a vape pen. So one's a new vapor, uh, and the other has been in vaping for for years, but smokes every single day. Um, and the reason why I don't know. I, I don't know if they got it from the same place or if there's some. You know, I, I have no clue. Or maybe the fact that maybe it will be start being recognized more uh, yeah, in general. And then the last case, which is a really cool case, uh, something I had uh, not seen before. I'll just show the long windows. Uh, and it's not a hard diagnosis. You can see the nice high density. Are they? Are were these high density? Yeah, not super high density, but nice mucus plugs, um, bronchiectasis. But the cool thing about it, which I have not seen before, is the coexistent, um, you know, basically findings that look like organizing pneumonia, but we know that chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, which this is biopsy proven, is basically the same lung injury is just caused by eosinophils. Um, and uh, so the eosinophils lead to the, the injury to the basement membrane exudation of material. Uh, so it looks very similar pathologically. You just have a bunch of eosinophils. So I, I've not seen the combined chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, ABPA, in the same patient at the same time. I don't know if you guys have seen that before. I, I, I have one case of it. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, the only thing she's missing is the church strauss. I'll see if um, I can find it. Yeah, so I, I thought I thought that was a cool one. One of my colleagues showed me that case, so that was, that was pretty neat. And uh, yeah, those are mine. So... I'll stop there. All right. I see David's on. Howard, if you wanted to show that last case. Okay. Sure. It's just for you, David. Don't take long. It's interesting. Yeah, I could do that. If you make me presenter. Hey, Jeff, this is Peter. I don't have any cases also this week. I just wanted to let you know. Thanks for letting me know. All right. So here is a patient that I saw, if I remember correctly, postoperatively. So here is a patient with a very elevated diaphragm. And I didn't have a lateral, but I'm just going to give you the scout for a CT that this person did have before. So we usually say that when you have a very elevated diaphragm like that, and particularly in the situation where the elevation involves a good portion of the diaphragm, but spares the posterior portion of the diaphragm, and the posterior portion of the diaphragm comes down to the same level as the opposite side, that is pretty typical for eventration. But like any rule, that one doesn't always work as you'll see. So this one is very elevated and it's hard to tell the top, but it's about here somewhere. So let me just bring in the, well, let me start with this. So in trying to make a distinction between a paralyzed diaphragm and an eventration, you can start from below, you can start from above, but one thing we look for is 
the crus and the thickness of the crus. So at least in this person here, we have a normal thickness of the crus and the posterior hemidiaphragm is normal in thickness. This image here, the sagittal, I like because if we go and look at this, now we concentrate on the, or look at the anterior diaphragm, we can see that it is normal in thickness for a certain distance, but then about here, it starts to get very thin, very thin and very thin and then imperceptible. And we've seen this before, but it's really interesting how, where the diaphragm starts to get thin and become just a floppy membrane, it curls back on itself like this and then goes up. And then you can see here, this goes way up there, but we do know that the posterior hemidiaphragm, or at least the crus, is normal in thickness. So with this morphology and those findings, this is very consistent with an eventration. But I think what you will like is, now I don't know if the surgeon before knew whether or really cared that much about whether it was a paralyzed hemidiaphragm or just a very even traded diaphragm because he was presumably asked to plicate it or consider plication, which is what he did. But I think you'll like this, so I'll make this big because here's a really nice description of the macroscopic finding in the op report. And here, upon further visualization, this did not appear to be a hernia, and I, I didn't know they thought it could be a hernia. It was consistent with an intact diaphragm eventration, diaphragm elevated all the way, and they were hoping to do this from the abdomen, but it, they couldn't. So assessed it for laxity, determined we'd be able to do a plication, and that's what they did. So here is a eventration, nice description of what it looked like at surgery, and did a plication for that. David, do you like that? I love it, it's a really big one. The question will be whether in doing the plication, they uh, took out the phrenic nerve and you will subsequently have thinning of the crus and it will have paralysis. So that's oh, the problem. Yeah. Doing the plication, you can uh, cream the phrenic nerve. That's why our surgeons won't, our surgeons won't um, operate on um, eventration because they don't wanna take the chance of damaging them. Oh, that's interesting. Creating paralysis. Yeah. This is what it looks like post op. Of course, they've brought it down a lot, but you know, how tight do you make that diaphragm? There's still some elevation of it after the plication at a post op visit or post op situation. But yeah, still even if even if you even if you get paralysis, it may be better than having had such a huge eventration. Yeah, I mean, certainly in the literature, um, one can find descriptions of plication for diaphragm eventration. True. And yeah, sometimes, sure. sometimes it works and it, and it spares the phrenic nerve, but it's not reliable. The, um, this really nice configuration here of having the diaphragm fold back on itself anteriorly, you know, that's the kind of mushroom finding that, that was described with herniation. And so when I, you know, you usually encounter that on the right, um, this is one of those cases where you see it very nicely on the left, but that sort of folding back, that sort of mushroom appearance um, makes you think of hernia, but it's very, very consistent uh, in cases of eventration. So there's this abrupt transition point. So my question is, what is it that, that causes it to, to fold at this, at this part? What is it that's sort of tethering the diaphragm into that configuration of having that sort of hairpin turn on it. There must be something holding it there to cause it to fold that way. I don't know, I've always just assumed that that's where the diaphragm starts to become thin and everything in the abdomen and the fat and the organs push on it and it just folds. I think, I think you're right. The, the progressive thinning of the diaphragm here, like that, right. I just assumed it's something like that. I think that makes sense. Or something like that. Yeah. yeah. All right, Jeff. All right, thanks. Um, let's see, uh, Travis or David. I have some. All right. David has some. He's welcome to go. Okay. 
All right, we'll start with this. I'm going to work backwards a little. This is how I encountered this patient. This is a patient that was transferred to us. And you can see they're intubated, pick. And first glance, you might think they just have lung injury, you know, like organizing phase of acute lung injury or, or ARDS, as we see a lot now with COVID. But I think if you look in this case, you can see this is a sharper image, but you can see here, even on the, the more conventional portable radiograph that just looks a little bit more discrete and nodular, almost little tiny, tiny little nodules throughout the lungs. And so I'll go back now to the presentation because this is a fairly dramatic case. This is a, a woman who presented to an outside hospital at the end of January, and she was 23 or 24 weeks pregnant, ended up having fetal demise, and at the same time was septic, developed ulcers on her feet and on her face, and you can see she's breathing through the lower lobes, but just these diffuse little micronodules that coalesce more in the upper lobes. And she is of, of like Central American descent, and this is all disseminated coxie. And she has not responded. And you can see at that time, it, it looked like this. This was a month later, and she's still breathing like crazy through this. And it's, if anything, becoming more confluent. She was not intubated at that time. She's been on multiple antifungals without success. And then this was a more recent CT about around the time of that radiograph that I showed you where now she's intubated and, and clinically meets a, a definition of, of ARDS. And you can see now maybe a little bit more bronchial dilation that we often see with an organizing phase of, of lung injury. But this is a, a manifestation of, of coxy that I can't recall seeing at least to this extent. And we've seen miliary coxy, but this is like beyond that. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. Was, and yeah, this was this was proven from you know, multiple skin biopsies. She has it in other organs as well. I don't know if she's had a bronch or or not, but you know, disseminated disease for you know, for almost two months now. Hmm. This is one I, I shared briefly with, with Jeff and Howard. And Peter, if that case from a couple of weeks ago that blew us away with your amyloid, I remember them having a lot of ground glass opacity and I remember them having more hyperlucent lung. I don't remember if it looked similar to this or not, you know, or if it was very similar, but this is a patient I actually saw the follow-up showing last summer's study. This is a patient with known AL, so light chain amyloid involving multiple organs. And last summer, you can see they have some hyperinflation of their basal or segments of their lower lobes. And so this looks like it's, I guess, mostly, I'd say, lateral and posterior basal segments here. And you can see on the left, kind of same thing. Maybe some of this is actually superior segment, but some of it's definitely basal or segments pooching up. That was last summer, and this is what I saw last week. And check out the progression that we see now in just over, well, just under a year. And now this is all lower lobe that's becoming more and more hyperinflated. And these basal or se this basilar segment on the right is going all the way to the lung apex. And on the left, similar thing. And so if you watched the, the, uh, the keynote lectures on Sunday, our pathologist, Kirk Jones, gave a nice lecture discussing cystic lung disease and talked about pathology, pathophysiology and, and mechanisms of cyst formation, and saying he didn't really think that ball valve mechanism contributed that much. But you know, this is a patient with light chain, and it hasn't been proven in the lungs, but you know, I think Howard and Jeff were saying Peter's case looks similar. And I did find a case presentation or, or a case that was just published last year. And this looks nearly identical, these images. I can zoom in. And this was a patient who did have this proven as, as uh, on biopsy as light chain amyloid uh, in the lungs. So, and, and 
Howard was saying that David, maybe you've presented cases that look similar to this in the past, but this was a pretty crazy progression over the course of a few months. Yeah, basal predominant emphysema uh, associated with some yeah. some nodules with high attenuation. So it wasn't just cysts; it was uh, emphysema, sort of ragged, you know, um, emphysema, not not nicely defined cysts. Yeah, and I'm not even sure. Do you just call this emphysema? It is hyperinflated lung. It's almost like more like bullous emphysema in in this case, but and then Except maybe a couple more discrete cysts. I don't know if. I think, you know, course. according to Howard, the main thing is the digestion of the lung. So it's emphysema, whether you consider it forming a bulla or. Well, yeah, just... I guess my question for with my question in this case, if you just have digestion of lung, there has to be some other mechanism causing this amount of overinflation here, because this is exerting mass effect and, and collapse on the rest of the lung. You know, it's not just yeah. central lobular emphysema or even pan lobular emphysema where you have a lot of digestion because usually those patients don't get this degree of overinflation. I guess it, it begs the question in patients with giant bolus emphysema, what's the mechanism? Because this is kind of similar to that, just a different distribution. Yeah. Well the theory uh, that I that I like and I've heard before in relation to bolus emphysema in general, particularly the so-called giant bolus emphysema and the vanishing lung, is the notion that number one, the idea that these air spaces, the emphysema or the bully, are under positive pressure is not right. They're not under positive pressure. And the way to perhaps think about that is that you have an area of lung that is very compliant. And when you breathe in, those areas that are very pliant or compliant fill preferentially with air before other areas of the lung until they get to a point where they're quite distended, then they stop distending. So that sort of concept of preferential filling of emphysematous spaces, um, and then the treatment of them is, is the notion, um, and I think that's what I believe, that's what I think is happening. It's not so much that they're overinflated, uh, inflated under positive pressure, but that they are preferentially inflated mm -hmm. Um, because they don't offer much resistance to the inflow of air. And it's only when they inflated and stop inflating do the rest of the lungs, in a sense, inflate. So that's that's the theory that I find attractive. So um, <clears throat> I, I would like to pile on Travis here because I, I have such rare opportunities to do that. So I absolutely agree <laughs> with him. So the notion here is really not that the lung is being, the adjacent lung is not being compressed, it's just allowed to relax because there's not an equal spring pulling on the lung out toward the periphery here. So you've digested the elastic tissue. It's like a moth-eaten sweater. If you stretch a moth-eaten sweater, the, the holes in the sweater are going to expand preferentially to the uh, more normal cloth. Does that make sense? I mean, it's really yeah. that you don't have the resistance to expansion. It's really relaxation atelectasis that you're seeing medially. It's not compression. It's relaxation of lung that has elastic recoil still. So you've digested the uh, the springs away from this end. So it's the lung is really just sagging open. It's not really under pressure. That's the main thing. The same thing is true of pneumothorax, and we've discussed that before. Pneumothorax doesn't push on the mediastinum. Pneumothorax on one side allows the elastic recoil of the other lung to pull the mediastinum in that direction. Sure. It's not tension, it's relaxation. Uh, you're relaxing the springs by, you know, having this pneumothorax, in this case, or having um, eaten the springs in the lung uh, with uh, elastases. So it's relaxation. You're seeing here, it's not really compression. Cool. So how do endobronchial valves, or why do endobronchial valves work in patients with large bullet? Is it just because the, the air gradually leaks or escapes from the bullet, and then that allows the rest of the lung to then just re-expand? Um, in the sense that um, 
I think the idea in part is that you, if you exclude the bully, you allow the lung that remains to fill with air and exchange oxygen. So mm -hmm. one way, if you sometimes, if you've seen, um, and I've never seen it in the United States, I've only seen pictures of it, but there are devices that they use in Europe, for example, that look like strange um, pieces of metal that coil up and they put those pieces of metal in the bronchial tree and when those pieces of metal expand and coil up, it basically um, has the same effect of, of um, trying to restore normally compliant lung around bully. Um, I've read a description which seems compelling is when you think of what resection of bullous emphysema does, it's like having a pair of socks full of holes. And if you get rid of the holes, you're restoring the normal architecture of the lung and allowing the lung that otherwise wouldn't exchange oxygen to, to do that. Is Vasilius on? Can he, can he speak to that potentially? Do you have any insight into that? Yes, uh, I'm here. Hello. Yes, I think you're correct. I don't have uh, actually something to add. Because if you put needles in bullous emphysema when they do that kind of surgery, they're not under tension, they're not under positive mm -hmm. pressure. Yeah. Okay. So you guys right. remember uh, increased marking emphysema or dirty lung in the setting of, uh, of emphysema? You know, that was really relaxation atelectasis in the lower lobes caused by emphysema in the upper lung. So the lung was just sort of sagging together at the bases and that made it look very busy especially in contrast to the uh, digested lung in the, in the apices. So increased markings was mostly atelectasis. And, um, you know, it wasn't really lung disease down there so much. And, you know, I had dramatic examples of that in having supine and prone chest radiographs in people with bad emphysema in their upper lungs. Their lower lungs were very dense and ground glassy. And you thought this is lung disease. But when you flip them over, you could make the uh, clear parts of the lung and the the ground glassy parts of the lung exchange from front to back by going from supine to prone and back. And that was really just, again, relaxation atelectasis in the lung bases. So, and why do awesome. endobronchial valves yeah. uh, uh, work? Because you stop the uh, airflow into the affected segment, mm -hmm. uh, segments of lung, and then the air is slowly removed into the bloodstream mm -hmm from those and they progressively collapse. So uh, endobronchial valves are a one-way valve. They keep, they keep the lobe from being aerated, the lung, the air gets resorbed and the, that part of the lung should uh, become atelectatic. Great. All right, I've got one last case. And oh, Peter, did that case look similar to yours aside from yours having diffuse ground glass? I can't remember. Can you repeat that? I was on the other side of the room for a second. I was, I'm reading the, that amyloid case I just showed with yes. more just the, of the emphasis. Was yours similar to that except for the diffuse ground glass? So, so mine was, uh, yeah, so mine was the difference I thought was yours had more, like it looked more, uh, like you mentioned, more expansile, um, um, more hyperinflated, like you were saying on the sides. I um, I actually tried sending it to you, but then I got a I got a message that I sent it to the wrong address, email address. I don't know why. So I can resend it to you. I'll oh, resend good. it to you. Um, right. And right. the, uh, mine was alveolar. Was yours alveolar septal? So I missed uh, that. There's no path on it. They have paths okay. from several other organs. Okay. Uh, with 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 light chain or with with al light chain amyloid from like epic uh like adipose tissue they suspect cardiac involvement they had some other tissue that they had biopsied as well mm -hmm. yeah I'll, I'll send you my case from last okay week. great all right and last one this is a, a young woman who was pregnant who presented with hemoptysis and she had one ct while she was pregnant this is actually follow-up after she was pregnant uh, after she delivered and before intervention. And you can see just below the level of the azagous vein here that there's this hypervascular mass in the airway. And I'll show you on, on 
coronal because you can see this kind of became a discussion because they weren't going to do they weren't going to do anything while she was pregnant because she wasn't that symptomatic from an airway standpoint. But the question is, you know, where was this? Is this main stem bronchus or is it trachea with the thought it's being hypervascular and it, you know, the, the rule being that carcinoids almost never arise from the trachea and arise from the main stem bronchi. Is it that or is it minor salivary gland tumor or some, something else? But long story short, they did take this out and they said it was coming from the right main stem bronchus rather than the trachea and it was a carcinoid tumor. But this is probably the most proximal bronch bronchial carcinoid I've ever seen, you know, mm. right at the takeoff. And there are isolated case reports of tracheal carcinoids. I think the teaching is that it almost never arises from the trachea. This is kind of like right at that that border zone, though, which I thought was just a nice little teaching case. And then, you know, I'll throw up the the PA and the lateral view. Just if anybody wants to volunteer that they actually see something here prospectively you know it's i think that yeah i don't know i was struggling with this one i don't think it's the the best position certainly the pa doesn't look like it's the best positioned radiograph the lateral i'm struggling as well because i think i see a little bit of rotation and this is the intermediate stem line but i don't know if anyone else cares to comment no, I don't think I perceive <laughs> any additional white thing. Yeah. On the lateral. I think that's the most proximal carcinoid I've seen in the airways. <laughs> I think yeah, I showed one in the trachea a couple of years ago. I can't. You I did know. have a tracheal one, okay. Yeah, I have one in a lecture. It might come from the AFIP archives, but I thought I had yeah. one. Maybe I'm wrong. It's a classic thing. I pull up a couple of articles and they're saying that, you know, it's rarely described with only 20 case reports. And of course, if there's 20 case reports, it means it's not that rare. People just stopped writing it up. But <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's uncommon. You're right. I mean, it's, it's uncommon, yeah. but I think yeah. I have. Yeah, I think pretty just about every tumor has been reported in the trachea, but, you know, there's like three or four that account for 99% of them. Okay. Right, um, David, do you have any cases this week? I did, but I didn't have time to massage them into uh, viewability. But um, not I've got a, a little closer to cases of rejection I want to show next week and get discussion. Not a problem. I'll go ahead and show some. Jeff, just really fast, I can show one article just so that, and I'll send this one around. But sure. The notion of the behavior of emphysematous bullying and the theory about the positive pressure and so on. This is a really nice description of it. So. This is an article from 1989 about the origin and behavior of emphysematous bullying. And you can see over here that the pressure was actually negative and similar in pleural pressure. And then this person is worth reading because there's a really nice explanation in the discussion section about the, um, about the behavior of these emphysematous spaces and the notion um, of how and why they look the way they do. And then, if I can just really quickly get to um, the part where he says that the effect of bullectomy and plication is not so much to ablate a space as to reconstruct the parenchyma of the lung in the manner of darning a stocking. And earlier in the article, he talks about the fact that these emphysematous spaces are quite compliant. He found that bully behave like paper bags which are extremely compliant until they are full when they become tense. And the lungs surrounding the bullet is less compliant and pressure required to inflate it exceeds the pressure necessary to inflate the bullet. So I like, I like this theory a lot. So I'll send this one around, but it's thorax 1989. Okay, Jeff. All right, thanks. Awesome. Look forward to seeing it. Okay, uh, so Seth, this is my, um, ABPA case with um, eosinophilic pneumonia. So you can see, um, let's see, um, you see there's the, the, the mucus plugs, dense, and then you have this patchy, looks like OPEP -E in the upper zones there. 
No, that's that's pretty. That's yeah. more fibrotic. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, this patient had asthma, if I remember. It's an old, 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 old case of mine. Okay, um, let's see what I got this week. Um, so this is something I have not seen before, um, and maybe people who do more cardiac imaging see this. So this was a patient who had a, a dissection here and needed a, an ascending aortic repair. And uh, this is a post-op CT. And when I first saw this, <laughs> you know, I felt that little pit in my stomach. I was like, uh-oh, that doesn't look good. Um, but in the, clearly there's probably something bad going on in the pericardium, but this collection here, and I'll make a coronal of it. Uh, I was glad I had an op note because um, what they did is this patient was having a lot of bleeding. And so there's a technique called a cabral patch where you uh, cover the root and you sew it and usually to the right atrium to decompress the bleeding back into a venous system. And so once I looked that up, I realized um, that actually there are, um, many variations of it and some places use it more than others one of the problems is you can have actually more bleeding from the right atrium than from the aorta so uh, it it um, it can be problematic but the surgeons can rely on this patch to sort of contain the leak and just shunt it back but you can see there's really um, a nice contained area of contrast here so this is a cabral patch i think there's probably there's at least some this pericardium is suspect and i was questioning a whether that was infected or not. But have any of you ever seen this Cabral patch? I did find this nice article here, um, just a little from what I did in a journal called Aorta of all things. Um, but here's the little diagram here. And this is a, a variant they use, but the, you can see this is where they um, they cover this up here and just sort of prevents the bleeding and it, and it goes back into the right atrium there is where they connect it. Uh, they used a pericardial patch. Um, but has anyone ever seen one of these before or heard of them? I, I, was, I was on a call. Can you show it again really, really quick? I, yeah, I, of the, the, you're saying that big collection around the aorta was is a surgical, it's, it's it, not a... It's called a Cabral, yeah. C-A-B-R-O-L patch. Yeah, yeah I'm, um, I'm yeah. Looking, um, like looking at the educational exhibits at RSNA because I, I know that at WashU they've seen a few of these and Costa has included them in talks. And I think you put one in an educational exhibit this past year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I we yeah. don't see those here. Yeah, that's the first one I've come across, and we would we we would, yeah. So um, yeah, it that, looks like a pseudo aneurysm. I mean, yeah, geez, really I mean, it basically is yeah. basically is a pseudo aneurysm. They right. just put a graft oh, around yeah. the. Root. Well, yeah. and it connects uh, with the right atrium. You said that's yeah. usually what that's usually how they do it. That should have that low. Okay. Yeah. And the goal is to sort of offload this blood back to the to back to the circulation to get rid of it. <laughs> so anyway, that was kind of a something I hadn't seen before. Now this is a really cool case, and I wish I had a radiograph, but I don't. Um, so this is an older guy with some emphysema, and has this ugly cavitary disease in the right upper lobe, some bronchiectasis. And a lot, a lot of crud just spilling everywhere. And you know, typically when we see this, I mean, some this is in acute phase, just a run-of-the-mill, ugly necrotizing infection. But this had actually been ongoing for a while. So, you know, typically I think about non-tuberculous mycobacteria, the so-called classical form of it, uh, the fibrocavitary or the cavitary disease. Um, but he didn't actually grow out mycobacteria; he grew out uh, histoplasmosis. And so there is a form of histoplasmosis called chronic histoplasmosis. It looks all the world like NTM, uh, and it's usually cavitary diseases. The rare times we see cavitary histo. I've only seen a couple of cases ever, and you can imagine we see a fair amount of histo around here in the Midwest. Uh, but this is just a really nice example. It's one thing to think about in a patient, and it's almost always patients with structural, usually emphysematous lung disease, older smokers, um, but it, it can mimic NTM. So it's one of the uh, ones to be aware of, especially if you don't grow if you don't get any AFB back, that may be one thing to think about. Um, and it's hard sometimes to actually get the organism. I don't know what the concentration is in sputum, but on BAL, they can often recover it. The antigens and antibodies are less useful just because they're often positive in a lot of people. Um, the other thing you would, might, be, might consider is blastomycosis, and there is some overlap of the serologies and stuff, but this doesn't have the typical blasto chronic. Blasto cavities usually aren't chronic like this. I'll make a coronal real quickly, but uh, chronic histoplasmosis. I've been looking for a good case for many, many years, and I finally came across one, so this was kind of cool. All right. Um, this is a nice case, not 
Uh, it's something we see all the time, but it's cool because I actually have correlative um, bronchoscopy. Um, so this patient, if you look at the trachea, I'll make it bigger. And I showed a more, I showed a more exuberant case before, but you see all these little nodules along the uh, cartilaginous surface there. Nothing to get terribly excited about, but we all recognize that as TBO, tracheobronchopathia osteochondroplastica. Um, but this is a, they did a laryngoscopy for something, but luckily they put the images on packs. And let me just scroll through it. Hopefully, they, eventually they get through into the airway there. Yeah. I don't know how they don't get seasick watching these, but it, there we go. As we start getting into the airway, we will see these little not. You can see a few right there, right there. Okay, so there we can see all the nodules on the rings. Remember, we're, we're there. They're at the patient's head, so everything's upside down. Um, but you can see right there. These are the little hyperplastic nodules, and they're all confined to the um, cartilaginous portions. They let's see, and you can see that how the posterior membrane is spared back here. But I, you rarely see it this well on a bronchoscopy because we see a little scattered ones. There's also a neck CT, which is just a little bit smaller field of view. Um, I don't know the window. You can just see all those little nodules there. So the, the main differential would be papillomatosis, but recognizing where these are confined to the cartilage. I thought that was kind of cool to get to see that. And then also, uh, also Jeff, there's there's sometimes calcified too, so you can recognize them as cartilaginous calcification. Right, yes. And then this is just a, another um, nasty infection, kind of looks like the chronic histo, this very cavitary disease with bronchiectasis and nodules. Uh, but this one has a lot of tree and bud or bronchiolocentric nodules. And so this is a good look for mycobacterial disease. But uh, this, this was unusual in that this is a patient who does not have cystic fibrosis, um, just has some mild emphysema, but this actually grew out Mycobacterium abscessus, which of course is a very is a rapid grower, tends to has a, a predilection for cavitary disease and is pretty much impossible to get rid of. Uh, requires some hefty uh, anti-mycobacterial drugs and often more suppressive therapy, um, unless you can resect it. But clearly, this is already spread there. But not one I typically I see it in CF patients, and actually it's a contraindication to transplant um, at most centers. I think maybe more uniformly now just because you can't eradicate it but this is one of the uh, really bad case but this is also the so-called classical pattern um, and it's called that because it looks like um and it looks it looks like tb uh if you did if you, for those of you who, are, who uh, watched part of the str if you watch uh, lucy uh, modal who's been on this webinar a few times she did a really nice talk on ntm and uh, she talked about the different patterns uh, of the disease you wonder um this patient clearly has some esophageal problems if that has something to do with it. I and mean, we do see um, uh, infortuitum with achalasia, but you wonder if some of these aggressive mycobacterial disease is maybe associated with, with current aspiration. So M abscessus, but outside of the usual chronic bronchiectasis CF. So Jeff, did this person have any underlying condition besides that uh, esophageal thing and the mild emphysema? No, no diabetes, not that anything else I'm aware of, just the usual, um, probably had some cardiovascular disease. Yeah, just the usual coronary stuff, but nothing nothing else. Because one of the classic, um, you know, mycobacterium avium situations is uh, older guys with COPD. Right, right, and and that's that classical form. And I, and I, I see, I've, I've seen that in that population and that's when, I, and, and the chronic histo is the same demographic, it's just very rare. But yeah, I've not seen uh, M. abscessus that often in a, um, patient just a just a run of the mill emphysema and this is all when we see something like this it's almost always max so i don't know i guess we've gotten a lot better at identifying the bugs and that may be part of it too um, but the problem is this one is just really hard to get rid of um, but i i don't know i know m fortuitum is another rapid grower and it is associated with achalasia so i don't know if m abscessus can also be related to this as well since they are sort of cousins okay um, that is all I have this week. Um, let's get back to the webinar here. Anyone else? We have a few minutes, just like two minutes, but if not, we can we'll meet again next week. All right, then. Well, thanks, everybody, and talk to you next week. Thanks, everyone.